Check out this fancy pants machine, dynamic drum system. So uh, this is a JVC Super VHS VCR. It's from the early 2000s, it's in the era of the ET. Uh, I did a video on my 3800 over here and demonstrated the ET quality. Um, I never demonstrated the Super VHS quality on it cause I didn't have any tapes. Now I do. And this one is a much higher end model, but I believe it's from a previous model year. I think that's how this works. This is the HRS 7600U. So I think the six means it's an older model and the seven is the higher end one. Might not have that right. Uh, what's kind of cool and what uh, drew me to it is this has a built-in time-based corrector. And I've been told repeatedly when I'm digitizing stuff, uploading, which I haven't done in a while, that you need a time-based corrector. And I've never used one. I haven't had one. They've always been expensive. And so I saw this machine for a very reasonable price and thought, yeah, okay, let's, uh, let's do that. It didn't come with the remote, but the remote that came with my 3800 seems to work fine. <laughs> I think I'm missing one or two buttons. So, yeah, whatever, good enough. And to test it out on, how about a JVC? I guess this would be considered somewhat of a monitor. It's not a PVM level. Let's get some light over here. But it's quite decent. Uh, I can't remember the model number. I'll flash it on the screen here. It has a very nice, pleasant picture. The color's not overwhelming. It's crisp, it's clear. It's probably not coming through in the video, but uh, I've been very happy with it. It This might make a lot of the retro game people upset, but I find it loads better than that 13FS100 that I've been using for a while. I don't know why, I'm just not a fan of the picture on that thing. So this might be my new favorite and uh, the FS100 has component, but it doesn't have S-Video. This has S-Video, which is nice. Um, obviously, if you have the choice between S-Video and component, component's better, but a lot of the stuff that I'm doing is S-Video only, like this machine. So to start off, let's pop a tape in this. This era of JVC just, it's new enough that it feels cheap. Every time I put a tape in, I'll show you with the cover off, it just slams it down, moves around, and I have had this lose control of the tape and jam up when going through fast forward and rewind. I haven't identified the issue yet. It could be an issue with one of the brakes gumming up, but it's all cheap and plastic. It's uh, functional, I guess. Hit play. So I'm going to now identify a problem that I had. See the picture jumping like this? What I had to do, so this tape, turn the volume down, that jitter uh, I cannot get rid of unless I adjust the tape guide at the head entry. And if I turn it ever so slightly, I'm able to maintain hi-fi audio without the tape jitter. But that means that now any test tape that I've recorded on this now plays funny and loses the hi-fi audio. And if I'm using the 3800 as a baseline, the 3800 is telling me that this is misaligned. So... I think the VCR that recorded this stuff was probably out of spec. And I do have VCRs that will play this okay, so I'm not really too worried about that. But it's kind of annoying that this thing is so incredibly sensitive that, you know, my cheap RCA made by Toshiba, my cheap Sony made by Samsung, they handle it like champs. And this super fancy... JVC made by the creator of VHS, you know, jitters. 
Anyway, let's get out of some commercials so I don't get flagged for this here. And to do so, let's demonstrate some of the features. This has a dynamic drum system. It will actually, and I, I haven't quite looked into how it does it, but what it does is essentially when you fast forward, you change the speed at which the tape's going past the video heads, which means you change the angle that they read the tape, right? Because it's going faster or slower. And that's why you get lines in your tape because you're, you're essentially reading across tracks. So those lines are actually separating two different fields, although you wouldn't really notice it. What this does is this adjusts the angle on the drum to compensate for that. So no matter what speed I'm fast forwarding, rewinding, pausing, anything, it will adjust accordingly. So let's give it a test. One and a half. Two. Now you're going to see a bit of noise on the screen and that's just because this probably isn't the best tape for it. 5x. seven X and I will show you another neat feature. What this does is it uses the linear audio head to record snippets of audio that it records while going in this fast speed into an audio buffer and then slows it down to give you a sample of what you're fast forwarding past. The quality is pretty poor because it's reading the tape really fast, but listen, Slow down. Now you get the hi-fi. And it also does this with pause. Which feels like some sort of a medieval torture device. I don't know why anyone would want this feature in pause. Pause is a, please shut up for a moment. I need to figure something out. The last thing anyone would want is for this to start playing whatever the audio is of what you just paused on loop. I don't know why that exists. That is just the, the fast forward and rewind is kind of cool, actually, having the audio. But this, this is like, why? So let's take a look inside. I mean, being a modern, what I would consider a modern VCR, you have all this extra space on either side because the only reason why it's as wide as it is is to fit in with home theater equipment and look high end. But in reality, it's just about the same size as all the cheaper models. There's the video head drum spinning away. Lots of cheap plasticky bits in here. This is kind of neat. Um, I Were they expecting tapes to be jammed in here as a regular occurrence? Is that why? Or is this just because this is considered more of a prograde model so you can easily remove your tape if it gets jammed? But this is kind of, I don't know, it's weird. Really not much to say, power supply, all the, I'm assuming this board handles a lot of the extra super VHS stuff and or stuff to do with the video head. So I'll show you what it looks like when it ejects here. Eject is a lot more pleasant than loading, but yeah, just real Real cheapy plastic, real bare bones, low cost. 
The head drum looks normal to me. I think the piece that changes is you see how there's this extra slit down here? So I think between this piece and this piece, this slit down here is where the piezo, I think it's, I read it's a piezo speaker that they use to just ever so slightly rotate it. I'm not quite sure exactly how that works. And I'm not willing to take this apart to find out because from what I've read, these can be problematic. Uh, interestingly enough, apparently Video 2000, the uh, Philips video format that was around in the 80s, I think, was it 70s too? Definitely in the 80s over in Europe. A failed format, but it's really cool. Uh, never made it to North America. It had a dynamic drum as well for um, special effects purposes, so it was actually superior in terms of all the special features that Beta and VHS eventually implemented. But, from what I understand, that was notorious for breaking. So, yeah. I am not going to touch it. I am going to leave it alone. And loading a tape. Just clunk slams it down there. So the reason I had that um, Avia DVD on screen here, um, I've had this DVD for years. It's got all the test patterns on it. And while that's probably not as good as a traditional test pattern generator, uh, it's what I've always had. And it's very convenient for making a test tape, which I have here. So took one of these let me actually turn that down. Bright, wonderful picture. So did this just switch? Yeah, so this just switched over to a... Oh, wow. So I'm seeing flicker on the screen between the fields. And this camera is perfectly syncing to one field or the other. You can see it move down really slowly. And it kind of changes. So you get this moiré pattern. Ah, do I go up? I see I go up. So it's very hard to make out on video filming at the CRT. It's actually very hard to make out. But on this, I'm losing resolution, horizontal resolution, right about 375 which I think is, is a testament to this TV, or a limitation, sorry, to this TV. Yeah, it's right around, right around here that I'm losing it. But when I look at it on the LCD, it goes a lot further. I can make out the lines here. I don't know if this camera, yeah, there we go. I can make out the lines there on this recording for sure. So the VCR is definitely capable of, of some decent uh, resolution. In fact, you know what? Let's record this on a regular VHS tape, non-SVHS, and see what it looks like. Okay, grabbed a random VHS tape, and I'm going to record on SP. I've got the... Oh, it's doing the active video calibration. So I think what this does is it figures out the levels similar to like a, what you would do on a three-head audio cassette recorder. Record this pattern for a bit, and we'll see how it does. So this is coming straight out of the DVD player, and you see that you start to lose it closer to 450. So much higher than the SVHS recording. Oh my god, what a difference. Look at that. Yeah, it's up at the 250. And you've got nothing, nothing at all. And I'm going to hit stop here so you can see what the source looks like in comparison. Wow. Man, seeing the, uh, the lack of resolution on regular VHS in plain sight like that is really a reminder that SVHS was, in fact, an improvement 
And the limiting factor at that point became the TVs and the video sources that were being recorded. Like, seriously, night and day difference. Um, yeah, you might end up with some blanking here. But you can see this all the way down. I can actually sort of see it 400, but it's getting to the uh, limitation, the TVL of this actual display, which again is not quite as good as like a Sony PBM. It's still pretty decent. And when we look up here, wow, what a difference. This whole area was just gray on regular VHS. And then to see the limitation of Super VHS, I'm going to hit stop and let's look at the DVD. There you go. So it's pretty damn good. Uh, this machine is not giving quite the quality coming out of the DVD player, but I can see it being, you know, near broadcast quality. It's just a shame that I don't have any actual content on Super VHS other than things like this test tape that I've recorded. But that kind of brings me to why I have this, is trying to digitize old commercials. I wanted to increase the quality that I get. Uh, right now I'm using what I like to call the technology connections method, the quick and dirty but looks pretty decent. Basically I've been using one of these cheap AV to HDMI converters, running it into an HDMI capture to USB. And this, well, no, this stupid thing stretches to widescreen. Then this captures it to MPEG-4. Then when I run it through editing and clean up the commercials and, you know, get rid of all the trailing stuff, I shrink it back down to 4x3 into a 720p format. I think it's 960 by 720 and upload to YouTube. And what I decided to do was get what might be a better converter. I haven't quite decided yet. This one handles, um, it doesn't, someone described it to me that this is basically acting like NTSC J as far as the um, color palette or brightness or whatever. Basically what happens is bright scenes tend to wash out into just white. And um, like if this is the brightness level available from a video signal, the converter doesn't quite see all the information. It doesn't, you know, span it or something. I don't know. Anyway, this one appears to do that. And this one also has S-Video. So the idea being I can run things through the time-based converter and the SVHS VCR when capturing. And I've been playing around with different capture method methods in the last while to see if I could find a better one. Uh, people have recommended stuff in YouTube comments and like I tried this one, actually it was a $8.99 thrift store find. I tried this Hope Hog PBR Rocket and you can see I did my little modifications there. And it'll take S-Video component or HDMI and capture it. And let me tell you, this is the flakiest thing I've ever used. The drivers suck. Uh, I, the, the, uh, the composite on this works for the most part. Quality is not great. And the S-Video is flaky as hell. I can't get more than two seconds without it just dropping out. And if you don't use a time-based corrector, this thing just freaks out. It, it just can't handle any unstable signals at all. And the problem is it just stops recording. So you have to constantly be there just staring at it in case there's any dropouts and then rewind and hit record again and hope for the best. And all that for quality that honestly isn't that great. Another method I've been using, I have another Hopog product. It's the HVR1800, a WinTV capture card. It's a PCI Express capture card that I used to use back in the Windows Media Center days. So it's got a digital ATSC tuner, an analog NTSC tuner, and I used to use this with some rabbit ears for over-the-air digital and, you know, used it as my PVR. And the quality on that is not bad, actually. It's, I would argue, it might be the best of everything that I've tried. But the inconvenience is I can't get it to work in virtual dub. 
I can only get it to work in OBS, but in order to get it to work in OBS, I have to sometimes open up virtual dub to get the driver to start. And then virtual dub won't be able to connect to the card, but the act of going to capture ABI in virtual dub makes OBS see it. So it's not great in Windows 10. And it also loses the 60 uh, fields per second. So instead of having, so what the uh, crappy little upscalers I use right now do, they take the 60 interlace fields and interpolate into 60 frames per second. So you get that nice fluid motion, that soap opera effect for content that has it. Whereas the Hopog interlaces into a 30 frames per second. So it loses some of that fluid motion. I don't think that's really a big deal, but on some content, it's kind of nice seeing that, that uh, fluidity. All these methods deinterlace with hardware. So probably not the best. I think a lot of hardcore video capture people go, have their processes a lot better. They go through all these extra steps. And I used to do that. And yeah, the quality was better, but I kind of think it's diminishing returns. And in fact, I did a bunch of samples and uh, sent them to people to get their opinion. <laughs> And at least one person picked the crappy upscaler that I've been using this whole time. So, you know, by the time stuff is uploaded to the internet, I think most people don't care as long as it's watchable. So anyway, that was a long rant into why I have this. I think it's super cool. I wanted to show it off just for that dynamic drum system and that weird audio sampling. It's, it's just bizarre. So here it is just on a pre-recorded tape going in one third speed backwards. This is the composite output on the TV here. But again, look, perfect frames. And this isn't like, this isn't like a digital, if I slow the video head down here, this isn't a digital frame buffer. This is the video head being properly aligned to the tracks on the tape. This is live. This isn't like some of the machines when you'd hit pause and it would find a perfect frame and then put it in a buffer. This is actually coming off the tape like that. Flippin' fantastic. Do I get audio with a slow speed? No, I don't because it's not going fast enough to record any audio into the buffer. It has to be going 1x or faster. So let's speed it up then. I don't think it does it in reverse either. Oh. Really? Okay, I need to try this out. Does it actually do it in reverse? I love how the audio gets worse. So now if I go backwards. Nope, did it freak out? Huh. Yeah. Okay. Are you all right there, VCR? Oh, that's not good. Oh, yeah, what are you doing, you cheap plasticky thing? Remember how I said I didn't want to take this apart to show you how the dynamic head drum worked because I didn't want to break it? Well, it decided to die on me just there. Wonderful. I thought this was just going to be a quick video showing something. I didn't think anything would be broken. Anyway, so I've gone and taken this whole mechanism apart. Thanks to a forum on digital fac, um, pointing me in the direction of the head drum. So there is, uh, these little gears that adjust the angle of the head drum. And people were saying that these will jam up. And if they do, 
Of course, when the VCR powers on, spins the video head, does everything as a self-test, these don't work, and so it faults out. And someone suggested to just, you know, give the wheels or give the gears a bit of a help with your finger from the top side. You can kind of see them from the top here. I tried giving them a spin either direction, just a gentle nudge to help. And uh, yeah, they're not doing anything. So I'm going to kind of inspect underneath to see if anything is broken or jammed. I did also notice this piece of plastic fall out and I believe it was from underneath this mechanism. So it could be something along this whole mech down here that has broken. I haven't been able to find where I think it would go yet. Let's see if I can find a picture of this online and maybe match up that way. Also those points of contact on the mode switch are pretty gnarly. Hmm. Look at that. Gears upon gears upon gears. This thing is like a little clock mechanism, except all the gears are made of plastic. I can't visually see anything wrong. Um, it's impossible for me to move the gears myself manually, so I don't know if it's something else faulting out in the machine or if it's the gears here. I'm starting to wonder if it is in fact the dynamic head drum. It kind of feels like it would be, um, given that I was using the special effects when it faulted out. However, I was also causing the, this mechanism to move back and forth into the different modes. And there is that piece of plastic I haven't been able to identify yet. Okay, so I've done some reading on this now. Some thorough reading. This was a bad system. It sounds like it's not a matter of if it will fail, but when. Cheap plastic gears that will break. And I know something about cheap plastic gears. Um, this whole machine is pretty cheap. Cheap, cheap, cheap. Now, all I did was take this whole thing apart, kind of wiggle some stuff around inside, and clean the mode switch. And now when I turn it on, it makes the little beep boop of the motor in the dynamic drum system doing a self-test. Uh-oh. That's what it's supposed to do, I believe. And if you notice, now it's not shutting off on me. But I think I'm kind of playing with fire with that dynamic drum system. So I don't know how long this machine's going to last. I don't think I'm going to play around and be all silly like I was doing earlier in the video as much as I really want to show those features off because that is, that was just cool. It looked fantastic. But I think for now, I'm just going to be very careful with this machine and really only use it for playing. That's it. Just playing. And I'm not going to go all crazy with my little jog wheel, as tempting as it is. Let's take a look at that tape eating problem I was talking about. So what I'm going to do is fast forward. Whoa. Even that was kind of chunky. Actually, no. Whoa, see? There. Just did it. This spun way out. And I got all this extra tape in here. So when it comes time to play, this hasn't tightened up. Now when I hit rewind, is it going to suddenly go bang and go back in? Yeah, okay. Stop. That's good. Let's try fast forward again. And stop. Yeah, the brake on this doesn't seem to work. 
Now, if I hit play once it's coiled out there, then it just eats the tape because there's not, the tension's wrong. Let's try rewind. So it seems like the brake on this spool is working. Oh, no, because it, it just spooled out there. Let's try fast forward. Get up to speed. And stop. Oh, oh that's horrible. So now if I go rewind, what's going to happen to the tape? Oh, what a mess. All right. So the brake pads appear to work, or at least they engage. If I go fast forward. to spin up to speed here. Now, oop. when I hit stop, one of these pads should press. No. Oh no, that's because the, yeah, okay. When the pinch roller is engaged, it's using the back tension arm to control this. When it's in, uh, when this is disengaged, and these are actually running in in uh, full rewind or fast forward speed, then it stops with these brake pads. But I need to make it go into that full speed. Okay, now we'll hit stop. The pad is touching it. So are these pads just worn out? So to summarize, this has a known infamous problem with the video head drum. It's cheap, plasticky, flimsy. It's very picky with the tapes that I put in it. And it has worn brake pads now. So not only do I not want to fast forward and rewind scan for risk of the head jamming up, but I don't want to fast forward and rewind at full speed either because the brakes are slipping. Anyway, uh, that's it. Thanks for watching. I'll put some uh, example captures at the end of this just to show the quality on this and everything like that. The captures won't really do it justice because, again, they're going through that cheap equipment. But, uh, yeah, anyway, until next time. MGM means great movies. Let's get going! I got an idea for a movie. Whose kinds are so safe? Uh -huh. Bad man, look!
We've got Christmas presents in store for you. Just look what's under the tree on MTN. Light up someone's Christmas with this Lucite chandelier and save $100 now till Christmas. Or take home these halogen desk lamps by Danalite from $59.95 at Superlight 1901 Logan. Nothing is as warm and comfortable to wear as sheepskin. These slippers are just one of the special gifts you'll find at the wonderful world of sheepskin, 579 Selkirk Avenue. Watch MTN to see what's under the tree because we've got Christmas surprises waiting for you. We've got Christmas presents in store for you. Just look what's under the tree on MTN. Light up someone's Christmas with this Lucite chandelier and save $100 now till Christmas. Or take home these halogen desk lamps by Danalite from $59.95 at Superlight 1901 Logan. Nothing is as warm and comfortable to wear as sheepskin. These slippers are just one of the special gifts you'll find at the wonderful world of sheepskin, 579 Selkirk Avenue. Watch MTN to see what's under the tree because we've got Christmas surprises waiting for you. We've got Christmas presents in store for you. Just look what's under the tree on MTN. Light up someone's Christmas with this Lucite chandelier and save $100 now till Christmas. Or take home these halogen desk lamps by Danalite from $59.95 at Superlight 1901 Logan. Nothing is as warm and comfortable to wear as sheepskin. These slippers are just one of the special gifts you'll find at the wonderful world of sheepskin, 579 Selkirk Avenue. Watch MTN to see what's under the tree because we've got Christmas surprises waiting for you. soon to video. Hey kids! Let's get dangerous! Now you could get dangerous! Alright! Because Darkwing himself has plucked his favorite adventures just for you. And now they're all yours on video.